ABC News Live. Nadalia on the move. After hitting Florida's Gulf Coast, the powerful storm quickly making its way to Georgia and the Carolinas. We'll have the latest on the storm's track. Plus, this is uh, the real deal. You have people's lives that, that have been at risk. The storm making landfall is a Category 3 hurricane with dangerous wind and life-threatening storm surge causing major flooding through Florida's Big Bend, leaving hundreds of thousands of Floridians without power. Rescue and recovery efforts are now underway. And... Did you hear the question, Senator, running for re-election in 2026? For the second time in a matter of weeks, Republican leader Mitch McConnell freezes on camera for more than 30 seconds, unable to respond when asked if he would run for re-election. Rachel Scott tracking the news on his condition. Good evening, everyone. I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis tonight. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more including Rudy Giuliani found liable by a federal judge in Georgia for defaming two election workers during the 2020 vote aftermath, now ordering a trial so a jury can decide how much he owes them. Plus, Ukraine launching a far-reaching drone attack deep inside Russia, taking out military planes, a fuel depot, and a military supply factory. We're going to take a look at what that means for the war. And a brazen porch pirate is caught on camera taking a package right out of the delivery driver's hands. We're going to bring you what happened next. But of course, we begin with Idalia's wrath, the historic storm pounding Florida, Georgia, and now South Carolina. The storm rapidly strengthening from Category 1 to 4. Idalia made landfall just before 8 a.m. as a powerful Category 3 hurricane in Florida's Big Bend near Keaton Beach. The powerful storm tearing up stop signs and ripping apart buildings in Horseshoe Beach, literally washing them away. This is the strongest hurricane to make landfall in this part of Florida's Big Bend since records began, and that was back in 1851. You can see the impacts here in Steinhatchee, Florida. The river that runs through town rose and then flooded that community. Tonight, crews are having a tough time getting in, and Florida's governor says there is significant damage in the region. And all day, teams racing to rescue any trapped residents. In South Carolina, the powerful winds no match for this car. Tonight, the sprawling storm is moving quickly north and east, as you see. And our team is standing by with the latest on where Adalia is right now and the damage already done. We are going to begin with Rob Marciano in Savannah. Tonight, Hurricane Idalia cutting a path of destruction and devastation across the southeast. Powerful hurricane making landfall around 7.45 a.m. with sustained winds near 125 miles per hour. The eye wall slamming ashore in Perry. As of five minutes ago, we all received a message on our phones about an extreme wind, an extreme wind warning, and you can tell why. Snapping trees and stop signs. Watch McDonald's Golden Arches ripped apart by powerful winds. It's starting to circulate around, and that when that rain hits you, I mean, it's like nails right to the face. Dwayne Williams and his son racing for cover as winds peeled away the roof above them. I felt the roof coming off, so I grabbed my three-year-old son, and I ran downstairs to the downstairs room, and they opened the door for me and my mom and dad. You know? But it was real terrible going on up there. On Cedar Key, AccuWeather storm chasers capturing record-breaking storm surge. Nearly seven feet of water, tanks, and other debris floating away. The surge tearing apart this home in Horseshoe Beach. It soon disappears from view altogether. High tide fueling the surge into Tampa. We got big waves rolling here. We have this massive storm surge that has inundated this beach and parking lot. Our Ginger Z in Pinellas County. It's been more than three hours since we saw a major historic landfalling hurricane more than 100 miles northwest of us. But look at this. We still are taking on water, coastal flooding right down Gulf Boulevard. In Pasco County, the sheriff's office helping rescue dozens of people and pets from flooded neighborhoods. This massive tree landing on the governor's mansion. Hundreds of thousands losing power across the storm zone. The fast-moving buzzsaw of destruction barreling inland across Georgia and into the Carolinas. An apparent Holy tornado flipping this car outside Holy Charleston. That car is flying! What the f 
Late today, President Biden pledging federal support to the entire region. If there's anything, anything the states need right now, I'm ready to mobilize that support of what they need. Nearly 12 hours after making that historic landfall, Idalia, now a tropical storm. And Rob joins me now from Savannah. Rob, this storm is jetting through communities at a very fast clip. Yeah, and that's why it held its strength uh, for so long through much of Georgia. But now, uh, just to the north and east of Savannah, it's pretty calm here right now. But the northern part of this still has 60-plus mile-per-hour winds. So we still have a threat for seeing uh, some tree limbs come down and more power outages. And also a tornado threat. We had that a flurry of warnings in Charleston, plus that one you saw actually touched down there. Uh, Wilmington, Myrtle Beach, areas across the Carolina coastlines uh, in that tornado watch till at least 10 o'clock tonight. And at that time, that's a right around the high tide when the high tide is going to come in. And it's a full moon high tide, so above average high tide, and of course a storm surge. So we're going to see storm surge flooding three, four, maybe five feet in some spots during the nighttime hours. So the next 12 hours, Phil, are still going to be very dicey. All right, Rob Marciano in Savannah for us tonight. Rob, thank you. And we are following Idalia's path now to Charleston, South Carolina. ABC's Alex Prache is there. And Alex, you just heard Rob mention it. You've already seen one confirmed tornado in Charleston. What's the latest? Well, well Phil, we, we, we've heard about a number throughout the afternoon. And so that is on top of these, uh, the, these, these, these storms and increased winds and rains that Adalia is bringing with her. Uh, but this one was, was, was about a 30 minute drive from us. A, uh, a, a, a tornado lifted a car in the air as, as drivers were motoring uh, along uh, the highway there. There was another instance where uh, about 45 minutes away where, where a separate tornado uh, lifted a porta potty in, 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 in a neighborhood. Uh, no reports of injuries in that case, in that first case where the, the, uh, the car was lifted. Two minor injuries, thankfully those people are okay. But this is on top of the rains that are coming in. And I can tell you that, look, I mean, we've seen the winds and the rains really kind of pick up this storm surge uh, making its way here. Listen, Charleston's known to flood, right? Um, but already we've had an urgent warning from uh, the National Weather Service here about four minutes ago. They were talking about significant coastal inundation uh, along much of lower South Carolina, including here in downtown Charleston, expecting the Charleston Harbor to rise by about seven feet into tonight. And, and Phil, we're, we're about an hour and a half away from high tide here. Yeah, not, not done just yet. All right, Alex Prache in Charleston, South Carolina. Alex, thank you. Now let's get right to ABC Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z on Florida's Treasure Island for a look at where Adalia's headed next. Ginger. Phil, we are watching this thing still racing. I mean, all day between 18 to 22 miles per hour to the northeast, and it is cooking. With the tornado watch on the map, you know there are those outer bands that can spin up tornadoes. We've been seeing them through the day. Uh, we've even seen warnings in North Carolina tonight. That could extend, but right now, the farthest north part of it goes till 10 p.m. I do want to mention that it will exit and make its way over the Atlantic tonight in the next couple of hours, but it is going to hug the coast. So that happens around Hilton Head, but you've got tropical storm warnings all the way to the Virginia state line because it stays just close enough and just strong enough because it's so fast that by tomorrow afternoon, we finally see the exit of Idalia. Before it does that, let's time it out. You see those white lines? We call those streamlines. They represent the wind and, and how strong against the coast it's going to be. So Charleston up through midnight, which unfortunately goes right up to that tide. I know that Rob was talking about, but watch as that heavy rain falls on top of the six to 10 inches, you've got that coastal flooding. So it acts like almost a plug. The river is trying to let all of the, you know, floodwaters out into the ocean, but then the winds are plugging it up. So two to five feet of surge there, two to four feet, that includes like Moorhead City up to Cape Hatteras. And I can tell you that you don't need a lot of surge. Two to four feet is what we had here. And if you look behind me, that's Gulf Boulevard covered in sand, a dune just here to my right breached and that allowed water well into the homes here, Phil. Hmm. All right, Ginger Z on Treasure Island in Florida. Ginger, thank you. Joining me now is Savannah's Mayor Van Johnson. Mr. Mayor, thank you for taking the time tonight. I know it is a busy night. Can you just start by giving us the situation? What is happening right now in your city? Well, thank you so much for checking in on us. Uh, Savannah is, again, a blessed community. Uh, it's bad, but not as bad as it could have been. Um, uh, Idalia has left our, our city, although we're still feeling some of the impacts. 
uh, storm surge has um, subsided substantially, um, but we still have significant wind around. Uh, we have about 40,000 people uh, without power in our community, and we have uh, trees that are down all over the place. So um, we are still asking people to, to stay in. Uh, it's starting to get dark. Um, we pulled our public works crews off the streets. We want to make sure that it's safe um, you know, for people to go back out. So we want people just to be cool for, for the time being. What are you most concerned about as you head into the night there? Well, the fact that people will go out. That people will go out. Um, they'll say everything is fine, uh, and these there's still wind gusts that are happening, um, that they'll go out and they'll see trees and they'll try to cut them down, not knowing if, you know, they're attached to electric lines uh, again. Uh, and there's still, you know, um, so, um, some residual uh, effects of this storm. So uh, because of that, we are wanting people just to, to be careful. Uh, it's just a couple of more hours. Uh, Georgia Power is working on helping us uh, get our power established. Uh, and then in the morning, uh, we'll go out and we'll see what we got and see how we uh, re repair and restore and open back up. Yeah, and it's an important warning uh, you're getting out there tonight to folks because uh, some of those dangerous times can be after a storm like this. I'm, I'm wondering, so many resources are needed to, to help a community after a storm like this. Do you have all the resources you need from the state? Well, we, we've been in contact with the White House uh, and with FEMA, who have reached out. We have Citizens Ossoff and Wanock, who is from Savannah, um, and they've checked in with us, and then, of course, the state. So, um, you know, for us, this is our Super Bowl. We, don't, we, we practice for this um, from June 1st to December 1st every single year. We know it's hurricane season, so um, we work together to be able to practice, 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 and now you execute your plans that you've practiced. So uh, this community did that uh, and and unfortunately the Lord has uh, blessed us and, and worked along with us in this and so right now again uh, it's certainly not as bad as it could be and our hearts go out to those uh, in Florida that were impacted so much by it and those in South Carolina who are starting to feel those impacts at high tide yeah ours do as well Savannah Mayor Van Johnson thanks for taking the time and good luck as you head into the night there thank you come see us soon absolutely Let's head now south to Florida, where Victor Kendo is in the state capital of Tallahassee. Victor, how are things looking where you are tonight? Well, Phil, now the race is on to restore power to tens of thousands of customers left in the dark by Hurricane Idalia. At last check, some 27,000 customers are still without power, but we know that crews are hard at work trying to get the lights back on. The biggest threats here in Tallahassee, uh, power outages, downed trees, wind damage, and we saw a combination of all three. Tallahassee, in part, is known for the tree-lined streets. The city is covered in trees, and with hurricane force winds, they can bring the trees down and take power lines with them. But in the end, Tallahassee did not take the brunt of Idalia. We stopped at a shelter today and met Harold Weaver from hard hit Perry, Florida. He evacuated before the storm with his grandson, riding it out at a Tallahassee school. And after seeing the images of Perry, he tells us he's happy with his decision. What's it like for you seeing your town, Perry, on the news underwater? Man, I always saw we had we, we had close to, uh, hurricanes close to us. I said, one of these days we're going to get one. Harold tells us that he plans on returning to Perry tomorrow, but that he has no idea what kind of condition his place might be in. Really, no clue what to expect here. Phil. All right, Victor Akendo, thanks so much. And for more on the situation there in Tallahassee and Northwest Florida in general, I'm joined now by Tallahassee Mayor John Daly. Mayor, thank you for taking the time tonight, too. Uh, last night, I know you were bracing for a direct hit. You were spared the worst of it, but as we know, that's not the only metric in a storm like this. So tell us what the situation is there today. that we did not bear the brunt of the storm. I mean, we woke up this morning thinking that we were gonna have a category four storm hit Tallahassee directly on. With a lot of preparation, a lot of great execution and a little bit of luck, we stand here tonight cleaning up debris that could have been much worse in our community. But yes, we have beautiful trees. We are known nationally as a tree city USA, but trees, power lines and high winds do not mix. So we are in the process of cleaning up and restoring power. Tallahassee area is providing shelter to some residents who evacuated the hardest hit areas. What are you hearing from those nearby cities and towns? 
So I've been talking to my colleagues, mayors, and a lot of the coastal communities remind you that Tallahassee is an inland community, so we haven't been faced with the same storm surge as they have. And we know that there is a lot of destruction, and they're going to have a lot of rebuilding. And part of being a uh, proud North Floridian is we help each other out. So Tallahassee is going to make sure that we uh, clean up our community and that we have the power restored, and we're going to stand ready to help our neighbors down the road. You know this well, Florida has a lot of hurricanes, so many people think the whole state is pretty hurricane hardened. Um, but this came close to being one of the first times the city experienced this kind of hurricane force wind. So what does that mean for you there as a city and more generally as we move forward with extreme storms? That's a great question. You know, after every storm event, we always do an after action report. What worked? What didn't work? What do we need to tweak? And how do we need to rebuild our plan? Very proud of the city manager, Reese Goad, and the leadership and the men and women in our public utility. We are the largest utility provider in the Big Bend region, and they are going to be working around the clock. About one third of our customer base is without power, but we have restored about 65 percent. They're working hard, but we learn from every event. But I think it's important to note the frequency of these storms, the intensity of these storms, and how big these storms are becoming year after year after year. You know, you know this well. Nothing brings a community closer together. Few things do, like, like the power of a storm. What will your city be doing in the coming days and weeks ahead to help folks around you in that region recover? Well, we are very proud people in Tallahassee, and we like to say we are Tallahassee strong. We're going to check on our neighbors, our families, our friends. We're going to make sure that we are all moving forward together. We're going to clean up the city of Tallahassee. We're going to be better, and then we're going to turn our eyes to our neighbors down the road and on the coast, and we're going to come together, and we're going to help them rebuild as well because there are times when we need the help, and there are times when our friends need the help, and we always stand together. You have resources there that you do you plan to deploy to areas around you? We do. We were lucky enough to plan in advance to bring in mutual aid agreements far as way as Oklahoma, Nebraska, Ohio, Louisiana, Mississippi. They are here helping us restore our power. Once we are up and running, I am sure we will deploy those resources to other communities that need it. As well, the city of Tallahassee stands ready in however way we can support our neighbors down the road as well. Yeah, and Mr. Mayor, we were just talking about this. It's some of the most dangerous times of a storm can actually be after uh, a storm when people venture right. out into water and, and, and try to remove trees, things of that nature. Um, you have a, a message for your community tonight? Yeah, that's a great question and a good one to end on. Uh, we continue to stress to everyone, hey, let's take the rest of the evening. Spend it with your family, with your friends, your neighbors. You know, let's stay close to home and let's let the professionals go out and clear the roads, restore the power, checking on our sewer system, checking on our stormwater system, natural gas lines. It's important that we stay out of the way so the first responders can keep us safe and healthy. And so let's let them do their job. Let's enjoy the rest of this evening. It's turned out to be a beautiful day in Tallahassee and let the professionals continue to work. Tallahassee Mayor John Daly, we do thank you for your time and your wise words, of course, after, after this kind of storm. We appreciate it and good luck to you. Thank you. ABC's Maria Villarreal has made it into Cedar Key on the Florida Gulf Coast. Maria, I know you just got there. Residents were just recently allowed in. How's it looking? Hey, you know, Phil, uh, we're actually standing where a lot of the big businesses are. This is the tourist attraction for Cedar Key. Take a look. There's about six or seven businesses here, and I've spoken with several of the owners. They all tell me that this is an absolute loss. There is nothing for them to salvage, and you might not be able to see that from the forefront, but really on the backside is what they are most concerned about. Take a look right here in the street, and this is what a lot of them experience. This is actually a piece of floor that came from the business I am standing right in front of from right here. That shows you the power, the fury of this storm and what it was able to do. Tear up this entire floor here, basically throw around all the furniture inside, rip out the back wall, and then push all of that with the storm surge onto the street. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of people that live here, business owners, they tell me that this has been their home for decades. Their families have owned some of these businesses. It's been in their families for, you know, decades as well. Um, it's devastating for them, and I think there is a large concern that they may not be able to come back from this. Um, they're being told there's a possibility they might get electricity back on in about a week, but without a place for tourists to stay, 
what's the point of rebuilding these businesses? So a lot for these people to digest and think about um, in the days and weeks to come. Phil? Yeah, it is just so heartbreaking, especially in a beautiful community like that. Maria, thanks so much. There is still much more to get to here tonight on Prime. Coming up, a brazen porch pirate caught on camera. Take a look at this. Taking a package right out of a delivery driver's hands. What happened just after this moment? But next, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell seen freezing in front of cameras for the second time in a matter of weeks. Rachel Scott with the latest. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. Welcome back. We have several other major stories to report for you tonight, starting with a concerning episode for Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, who uh, appeared to freeze, unable to answer a question at an event in his home state of Kentucky today. It is his second episode in the last few weeks. Here's ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Tonight, new questions about the health of the Senate's top Republican, Mitch McConnell, after he froze in front of the cameras, seemingly unable to speak for the second time in just over a month. What are your thoughts on running for re-election in 2026? What are my thoughts about what? Running for re-election in 2026. Oh, awesome. That's <clears throat> Did you hear the question, Senator? Running for re-election in 2026? All right, I'm sorry, you all. We're going to need a minute. Senator. Benny. Yep. Go ahead, I'm sorry, sorry. The senator ultimately taking a few questions before being led away. Last month, a similar episode on Capitol Hill. McConnell freezing for 20 seconds, unable to finish his sentence. Are you good? Mitch. Hey, Mitch. Anything else you want to say? I'm sure it's go back to your office. Do you want to say anything else to the press? McConnell's office telling ABC News, in both instances, the senator just felt lightheaded. But concern is growing for the 81-year-old leader, who has had a series of health scares this year. A fall in March left him with a concussion and fractured rib. He spent weeks in rehab. Then in July, another fall on an airport jet bridge. And sources tell us that for months, the senator has sometimes used a wheelchair. And Rachel joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, how are members of Congress and even the White House reacting to this latest incident today? 
Well, Phil, leaders on both sides of the aisle are wishing McConnell well tonight. President Biden says even though he disagrees with McConnell politically, he does consider him a good friend. But this is certainly putting a spotlight on the age and the health of our leaders on both sides of the aisle, including the front runners for the White House. President Biden is 80 years old. Donald Trump is 77. As for McConnell, his office tells me that he does plan to see a physician before his next event. Phil. It was hard to watch. Everybody wishing him well. Rachel, thank you. A federal judge in Georgia has found Rudy Giuliani liable for defaming two election workers during the 2020 vote aftermath. It will now be up to a jury to figure out how much he owes them. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky with details. Tonight, a federal judge finding Rudy Giuliani liable for defaming Georgia election workers Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. This is what Giuliani told the world as he repeatedly and falsely accused the mother and daughter of stealing ballots. Of Ruby Freeman and Shea Freeman Morris and one other gentleman quite obviously surreptitiously passing around USB ports as if they are vials of heroin or cocaine. The women told the January 6th committee Giuliani's false claims ruined their lives. I've lost my name and I've lost my reputation. I've lost my sense of security. All because a group of people starting with number 45 and his ally, Rudy Giuliani, decided to scapegoat me and my daughter, Shay to push their own lies about how the presidential election was stolen. Giuliani has conceded his statements about Moss and Freeman were false, though he insists they were protected by the First Amendment. But today, Judge Beryl Howell holding him liable for defamation, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and civil conspiracy. She says she entered the default judgment because Giuliani failed to turn over evidence, only, quote, blobs of indecipherable data. Now a jury will decide how much Giuliani has to pay Freeman and Moss. He's said to be nearly broke, though he arrived in Georgia to surrender on criminal charges in a private plane. No word tonight on who foot the bill. A spokesman for Giuliani called today's ruling a prime example of the weaponization of the justice system. Freeman and Moss said it affirmed there was never any truth to any of the accusations. They said they went through a living nightmare and that Giuliani unleashed a wave of hatred and threats they never could have imagined. Phil. Aaron Katursky tonight. Aaron, thank you. Next, Ukraine launching its most far-reaching drone attack yet deep inside Russia across at least six regions. This as they vow its attacks will continue deeper and deeper inside Russia. ABC's Britt Clenet is in Kyiv for us. Tonight, Ukraine unleashing its most widespread drone attacks inside Russia since the war began, seen in footage posted online. This airbase in Peskov, one of several military targets across at least six regions. Video circulating on social media showing thick smoke rising above the facility. At least four military planes destroyed. A fuel depot and military supply factory also struck. Russia today retaliating in the biggest attack on Kyiv since spring with a barrage of drones and missiles. The debris killing at least two people. Crews hosing down the smouldering wreckage in this neighborhood. And residents picking up the pieces after missile fragments and fiery debris rained down on their homes. Tonight, Moscow vowing drone attacks on Russian soil will not go unpunished. But Ukraine now signaling it is willing to hit Russia where it's most vulnerable. A tactic Ukraine's spy chief warned about months ago. Do you think there'll be more? I think so. Yeah, more attacks? inside Russia, deep inside Russia. Deeper and deeper. And Brit joins me now from Kyiv. Brit, there is word now of potential deals between Russia and North Korea. What's the latest you have? Yeah, Phil, it looks like a potential deal is in the works which would involve arms to use in its war here in Ukraine. Meanwhile, on those drone attacks in Russia, a Kremlin propagandist on state TV had some very rare criticism, saying if we can't cope with drones, how will we cope with F-16s? Phil? Valid question. Britt Clenet from Kyiv tonight. Britt, thank you. 
Canada has issued a new warning today to the LGBTQ travelers in the United States. The advisory warns about laws and policies that may affect them. The advisory comes as the United States has seen a recent rise in legislation targeting the LGBTQ community. According to the Human Rights Campaign, more than 500 anti-LGBTQ bills have been introduced in state legislatures in 2023 alone, with at least 70 being enacted. Baseball legend David Ortiz revealing today he is a victim of an extortion attempt by hackers. Ortiz, known to fans as Big Poppy, claims hackers gained access to one of his old cell phones and they are threatening to reveal personal information. The former Boston Red Sox slugger came forward in a video posted to his social media, adding that authorities in both the United States and Dominican Republic were taking action in the case. There's still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, the ruling from a judge on whether a formerly high-ranking Catholic official can stand trial on sex abuse charges. But next, we take a look at just how many parents are now moving in with their adult children by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. One, two, three, let's go! Non-stop drama. Scandal. It is shocking. Kanye West. Ciao. Complicated. The website runs! Ah! Meg, how do you feel? I was shocked. It was... Horrifying. The kids were gone. Are these miracle drugs? To lose weight. I wanted that body. Close your eyes right now. Holy <laughs> There's nothing else like Impact by Nightline. Enjoy the ride. Mind blowing. Don't miss the Impact by Nightline binge this Labor Day weekend. Streaming on ABC News Live. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes, escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This this is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Welcome back. The trend of young people moving back in with their parents has been well documented through the pandemic, but according to the Wall Street Journal, data from Pew Research Center shows we may also be seeing the reverse as parents move in with their kids. Let's take a look by the numbers. As of 2021, one in four young Americans between the ages of 25 and 34 live with their parents or older relatives. Much of that is young people moving back in with their parents, the so-called boomerang effect. But about 9% of multi-generational households in 2021 were led by millennials whose parents have moved in with them. That's up from 6% 20 years earlier. That reverse boomerang effect, as it's called, is expanding the scope of multi-generational homes defined as two or more adult generations living under one roof with more parents not waiting for retirement or health reasons to move in with their kids. Instead, high housing costs and the growing need for help with childcare is bringing more families together. Just 12% of Americans lived in multi-generational homes back in 1980. That's the lowest point in the past century, according to Pew. But that now has climbed to nearly one in in five Americans living in multi-generational homes. Both the 2008 financial crisis and the COVID pandemic, of course, helped drive that trend. The housing market has been a key factor as well. In 2022, 14% of home buyers set up multi-generational households, according to the National Association of Realtors. That's up from 11% just a year earlier. The trend is even dr driving a change in how some homes are actually built with separate living spaces for older parents and more space to try to preserve privacy. And in some cases, yes, sanity. And there is much more ahead here on Prime. A strike authorization vote passes for flight attendants at a major airline. Why it's unlikely to result in an actual strike. And are whoppers living up to the advertisement? Class action suit from customers who say they were duped. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. 
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. A judge rules on whether a defrocked cardinal will stand trial for sex abuse charges, how soon the life-saving drug Narcan could be available over the counter, and a brazen porch pirate is caught on camera. Those stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. Today, the bell tower on the University of North Carolina campus rang out as students observed a moment of silence for the faculty member killed in a shooting on the Chapel Hill campus Monday afternoon. The campus was on lockdown for three hours Monday after a grad student allegedly opened fire, killing Zizi Yan, an associate professor who was listed as a suspect's academic advisor on a UNC website. Yan earned several degrees in China before coming to the United States to get his PhD. Today, a judge ruled that a defrocked Catholic official being tried for sex crimes is incapable of standing trial. Former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick's defense team said in court that he's innocent and he has dementia, making him unable to defend himself at trial. Prosecutors accused the 93-year-old of molesting a teenager in Massachusetts. The Pope had defrocked McCarrick in 2018 after an internal investigation found credible evidence of similar incidents in New York in the 1970s. Narcan, an over-the-counter life-saving drug that can reverse an opioid overdose, will soon be available in drugstores. Walgreens says Narcan will be available on store shelves without a prescription as early as next week. The maker suggests a price at just under $45, and the CDC recommends anyone at risk or knows someone who could suffer an opioid overdose should carry Narcan or keep it in their home. It is a nasal spray that can quickly restore breathing after taking too many opioids. About 99% of flight attendants for American Airlines voted to authorize a strike. The vote does not mean there will be a strike, but the Association of Professional Flight Attendants Union will be authorized to call for a work stoppage based on the results of the vote. An actual strike of flight attendants is unlikely in the U.S. because federal law makes it difficult for aviation unions to conduct legal strikes. Congress and even the president can delay or block an airline union from striking. Watch as a man calmly walks beside a FedEx worker delivering a package, then suddenly snatches the box right out of her hand and makes a run for it. This guy right in front of my door, just grabbing the package and just running away. Instead of receiving the iPad she ordered, she heard banging on the door from the FedEx worker moments later. She was like, can you open the door, please? I'm like, what's going on? She's like, someone stole your package. I'm like, what? FedEx telling us the safe and secure delivery of our customer shipments is a top priority. We are working with local authorities as they investigate this incident. This morning, a major food fight brewing over Burger King's famed Whopper. A judge denying the fast food chain's motion to dismiss a case, claiming it falsely represented the size of the sandwich. Consumers who signed on to the proposed class action lawsuit accused Burger King of depicting its best-selling burger with ingredients that overflowed the bun, making it appear 35% larger with roughly double the meat than it actually has in real life. Burger King telling ABC News the plaintiff's claims are false. The flame-grilled beef patties portrayed in our advertising are the same patties used in the millions of Whopper sandwiches we serve to guests nationwide. Turning now to the son of convicted murderer Alec Murdoch, speaking in a new interview about his father and the killings of his mother and brother. Buster Murdoch insists his father is innocent, and he maintains he lives in fear of the person who murdered his mother and brother, who he says is still at large. ABC News Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman with the story.
Buster Murdoch speaking out for the first time since his father Alec was convicted of murdering Buster's mother and brother. I do not believe it was fair. The 26-year-old telling Fox Nation for an upcoming docu-series, The Fall of the House of Murdoch, he believes his father is innocent. Did you ever go there and say, maybe it's possible that he did this? No, because I think that I hold a very unique perspective that nobody else in that courtroom ever held, and I know the love that I have witnessed. Guilty, 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 guilty. Alec Murdoch, once a prominent South Carolina attorney, was sentenced to two life sentences for the slayings of his wife, Maggie, and their youngest son, Paul Murdoch, in 2021. Through every step of this high-profile murder case, Buster standing by his father. Alex smiling on as his only surviving son testified in his defense, even giving Buster that pat. He was destroyed. He was heartbroken. I walked in the door and saw him and um, gave him a hug and just, just broken down. Maggie and Paul Murdoch were shot to death on June 7, 2021. Their bodies were found at the dog kennels of the Murdoch South Carolina hunting estate, but Alec claimed he was not at the scene. However, a key piece of evidence contradicted that. A Snapchat video Paul recorded moments before his death appeared to show him at the kennel with his father's voice appearing to be in the background. Placing Alec at the scene. Did you go over to the kennels at all? No, I did not. People did tell me not to go down there. The crime scene had been like cut off and they sent everybody, sent everybody over to the house. A jury of 12 finding the Murdoch patriarch guilty in the slayings, but his son believes they were biased. I was there for six weeks studying it, and I think it was a, a tilted table from the beginning. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of the jurors felt that way prior to when they had to deliberate. It was predetermined in their minds prior to when they ever heard any shred of evidence that was given in that room. After the trial, one of those jurors spoke exclusively with GMA. If you really look at everything, it's, it's, it's all plain and clear. But while Buster stands by his father, he acknowledges his shortcomings. Do you ever worry, you know, am I like dad? No, I do not worry because I am not a thief. I am not a, a liar. I'm not a manipulator. In those regards, I am nothing like him. But in other regards, I believe that I do hold some of his more admirable traits, which I am quite proud of. Our thanks to Matt Gutman for that. Now to an horrific flight from Milan, Italy to Atlanta. Delta Flight 175 was about 40 miles from the Atlanta airport when it hit some major turbulence, injuring four people, some of them seriously, including one passenger had to be carried out on a stretcher. Here's ABC's Trevor Alt. Tonight, new images showing the aftermath of this terrifying Delta flight from Milan to Atlanta rocked by severe turbulence. A passenger carried off the plane on a stretcher, another walking off in a neck brace, others given ice packs. 14 passengers and crew sustaining injuries, 11 of them taken to the hospital. The woman in the aisle next to me flew up and hit the overhead bend. I honestly thought we were crashing. The Airbus A350 was approximately 40 miles northeast of the Hartsfield-Jackson Atlanta International Airport last night when the FAA says the crew reported severe turbulence. To the 175 heavy runway left to the left. The 151 passengers and 14 crew aboard landing safely. Experts now speculate the rapid escalation of hurricanes may have caused the bumpy ride. Usually this type of severe turbulence occurs over water at night. This is unusual. Uh, what happened in this particular instance may be related to the hurricane. In a statement tonight, Delta says its priority is taking care of the customers and crew who sustained injuries, adding we are grateful for the first responders who met the aircraft to provide medical attention and who are transporting the injured to the hospital. Our thanks to Trevor Alt for that. Summer concert season is wrapping up, sad. Beyonce and Taylor Swift seem to be this year's two biggest headliners. But scoring a ticket to see one of them was not at all easy, if at all possible, on the wallet. So much so, that listen to this, some music lovers actually packed their bags for Europe, paying less for the entire overseas road trip than they would have paid for a trip to their hometown stadium. ABC's Ashan Singh has the story. Okay, we're going to see Beyonce! Diehard fans are packing up. Here are my clothes. Hopping on transatlantic flights. 
Come with us to see Beyonce in Europe. Hitting historic sites. Now we're at the Eiffel Tower. And seeing the biggest concerts in Europe. Yeah, Beyonce is about to come out. the hottest travel hack this summer for all those crazy in love with Beyonce. Barcelona, Sunderland, England, and Stockholm. Not usually the typical concert stops for Americans. As soon as she says who, what, where, when, and how the tickets are going on sale, I'm definitely going to see her abroad. For Mercedes Ariel, traveling more than 5,000 miles to Stockholm to see Queen B, was worth every minute of the trip. Witnessing her talent, she basically was like, oh, y'all wanted visuals? Oh, y'all, oh, you want visuals? She <laughs> just, the way she served the people, it, it was something for everyone. It was, it, the outfits were amazing, the hair was herring, the body was bodying. She just, she, she gave, she gave everything. It wasn't quite as long a trip for Raymar Dinglis, who left his Kansas City home for a concert in Hamburg, Germany. It was such a surreal experience. T minus 10 minutes until Beyonce. She's still absolutely killing it. And she was having so much fun. Um, and the crowd was totally uh, with her. The big payoff for these long journeys, tickets can be a lot cheaper than they are stateside. Earlier this year, Ticketmaster's website showed a single seat for Beyonce's August 9th concert in Charlotte, North Carolina, going for $822, while a similar seat to her Stockholm, Sweden show on May 10th, just $225, less than a third of the cost. Travel content creator Mercedes says the cost of her flight, hotel, concert tickets, and all the extras in Sweden was less than the price of a single concert ticket in her hometown of Dallas. What does that total come out to be? Under seven. Under seven hundred dollars, not just for the ticket, but for how many days in Stockholm? Four. And forty hours in Paris, mm -hmm. all for under seven hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable. Yeah. To understand why some concert lovers are choosing to hop across the pond, there's the painful memory of last year's spectacle when <laughs> legions of devoted Swifties couldn't buy tickets for Taylor's U.S. Eras tour. The line has stopped moving. They waited in line for like six hours. Ticketmaster's site crumbling under overwhelming demand. The website fully crashed. With seat prices skyrocketing, sometimes into tens of thousands of dollars. Taylor Swift fans were outraged, and Taylor Swift fans, like Taylor herself, are very adept at social media, and the outrage spread. Ticketmaster explained the problem last November in part saying, the biggest venues and artists turn to us because we have the leading ticketing technology in the world. That doesn't mean it's perfect. And clearly for Taylor Swift, the Eras tour on sale, it wasn't. But we're always working to improve the ticket buying experience. Last week, a repeat performance of sorts. When tickets went on sale in France for Taylor's Eras tour next summer, the site crashed. We've been here before, it happened again. Ticketmaster France pointed to issues with a third party and resumed sales this week. I really, really wanted to see Beyonce. It was my first time. Superfan and marketing coordinator Raymart Dinglis says last year's ticketing fiasco spurred him to look abroad. It was pretty easy. I just had to set up a Ticketmaster account for Germany and then just toggle the language settings to English and then I was able to get tickets. Raymart and his partner planned a vacation around Beyonce's concert in Hamburg. How much did it all cost? Tickets were about 150 euros each. And then the hotels were like pretty affordable. But we were there for three nights. So I guess in total, we probably spent like $1,000. You pretty much went to Europe, saw Beyonce, and had a whole trip for, for about a grand. Yeah, exactly. Mercedes jumped at the chance to see her in Stockholm. I did a little bit of playing. I had seen her in Paris already. I went to Barcelona not that long ago. London is always expensive. You know, the pound is stronger than the dollar. When I saw the ticket price to Stockholm was under um, 
15,000 miles each way. I, I, I bought my ticket before I even bought my concert ticket. The EU and different individual European countries have different laws so that, that cap the amount that any reseller can make reselling a ticket. And that keeps the ticket market normal. Can you sell that ticket for more? Yes. Can you sell it for 5,000? percent higher than the face value? Absolutely not. So what drives up U.S. concert ticket prices? The real problem is not Ticketmaster. The real problem are scalpers and bots and these evil things that are, in fact, evil. Another factor, U.S. ticket prices can fluctuate based on demand. The idea behind dynamic pricing is to match the real market value of the tickets. So if a particular artist is exceptionally popular, the tickets are priced a little bit higher right away because there's an algorithm that recognizes that tickets that might otherwise cost, let's say, $100 could theoretically be sold on the secondary market for $1,000 or maybe two or three times that. But Swift's team told ABC News last year that, quote, Taylor chose not to use and will not use dynamic or platinum pricing on Taylor Swift, the era's tour. According to Yale School of Management, Ticketmaster currently controls over 70% of the market for ticketing and live events. You have the world's largest concert promoter that owns the world's largest ticketing company, and this same company owns and operates venues. To a lot of people, this looks very much like uh, a vertical monopoly. Transparency in pricing is also on the president's radar. The White House blaming the rise in ticket costs partly on junk fees. The solution is what it's called all-in pricing. Starting in September, Live Nation will automatically list all the prices up front. As for the leading ladies themselves, both Beyonce and Taylor Swift are making history. Forbes estimates B's Renaissance Tour could earn her more than $2 billion. And Taylor's fans still feeling that lavender haze. With the era's tour boosting sales, she now has more number one albums than any woman in history. Mercedes says even though she and other fans traveled to see these iconic artists, everybody should take the risk, even if they have limited means. I would say consider what you're wanting to get out of your experience. Make a short list of places you think that you can get that. Be realistic with yourself about your budget, budget and what your bottom line is in terms of off the door. Um, and don't be afraid to go somewhere that you never considered. How many people came up to you and said, hey, we were able to come to this show because of your guide? Pretty much every black person that I saw that was American was like, hey girl, what's up? <laughs> you made me want to do something that I never would have considered. And the coolest part was that there were so many girls who didn't even have passports and ended up getting passports, taking their first international flight, getting their first stamp because of me and B, like, what? What a great idea. Our thanks to Ashen Singh for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Phil Lipoff. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, Idalia's path of destruction. We have team coverage as we survey the damage and flooding already left behind. We track where it's headed next. And armed forces deployed across a border city in Mexico, the directive they've received from the government. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? 
Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen. Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Phil Lipoff. I'm in for Lindsay Davis tonight. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to, including for the second time in a matter of weeks, Republican leader Senator Mitch McConnell freezes on camera for more than 30 seconds, unable to respond when asked if he would run for re-election. Rudy Giuliani found liable by a federal judge in Georgia for defaming two election workers during the 2020 vote aftermath. Now ordering a trial so a jury can decide how much he owes them. And Ukraine launching a far-reaching drone attack deep inside Russia, taking out military planes, a fuel depot, and a military supply factory. We're going to look at we're going to take a look at what that means for the war. And of course, we're going to begin with Idalia's wrath, the historic storm pounding Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Idalia made landfall just before 8 a.m. as a powerful Category 3 hurricane in Florida's Big Bend, right near Keaton Beach. The powerful storm tearing up stop signs, ripping apart buildings in Horseshoe Beach, and washing them away. This is the strongest hurricane to make landfall in that part of Florida's Big Bend since records began, and that was back in 1851. You can see the impacts in Steinachi, Florida. Tonight, crews are having a tough time getting in, and Florida's governor says there is significant damage in the region. All day, teams race to rescue trapped residents. In South Carolina, the powerful wind, no match for this car. Look at that. And tonight, we are getting reports water is moving into downtown Charleston. So, where is Adalia right now? We will have the latest track in just a minute for you, but we are going to begin with Rob Marciano in Savannah. Tonight, Hurricane Idalia cutting a path of destruction and devastation across the southeast. A powerful hurricane making landfall around 7.45 a.m. with sustained winds near 125 miles per hour. The eye wall slamming ashore in Perry. As of five minutes ago, we all received a message on our phones about an extreme wind, an extreme wind warning, and you can tell why. Snapping trees and stop signs. Watch McDonald's Golden Arches ripped apart by powerful winds. It's starting to circulate around, and that when that rain hits you, I mean, it's like nails right to the face. Dwayne Williams and his son racing for cover as winds peeled away the roof above them. I felt the roof coming off, so I grabbed my three-year-old son, and I ran downstairs to the downstairs room, and they opened the door for me and my mom and dad. You know? But it was real terrible going on up there. 
On Cedar Key, AccuWeather storm chasers capturing record-breaking storm surge. Nearly seven feet of water, tanks and other debris floating away. The surge tearing apart this home in Horseshoe Beach. It soon disappears from view altogether. High tide fueling the surge into Tampa. We got big waves rolling here. We have this massive storm surge that has inundated this beach and parking lot. Our Ginger Z in Pinellas County. It's been more than three hours since we saw a major historic landfalling hurricane more than 100 miles northwest of us. But look at this. We still are taking on water, coastal flooding right down Gulf Boulevard. In Pasco County, the sheriff's office helping rescue dozens of people and pets from flooded neighborhoods. This massive tree landing on the governor's mansion. Hundreds of thousands losing power across the storm zone. The fast-moving buzzsaw of destruction barreling inland across Georgia and into the Carolinas. An apparent Holy tornado flipping this car outside Holy Charleston. That car is flying! What the... Late today, President Biden pledging federal support to the entire region. If there's anything, anything the states need right now, I'm ready to mobilize that support of what they need. Nearly 12 hours after making that historic landfall, Idalia, now a tropical storm. And Rob joins me now from Savannah. Rob, this storm is jetting through communities at a very fast clip. Yeah, and that's why it held its strength uh, for so long through much of Georgia. But now, uh, just to the north and east of Savannah, it's pretty calm here right now. But the northern part of this still has 60-plus mile-per-hour wind. So we still have a threat for seeing uh, some tree limbs come down and more power outages. And also a tornado threat. We had that a flurry of warnings in Charleston. Plus, that one you saw actually touched down there. Uh, Wilmington, Myrtle Beach, areas across the Carolina coastlines uh, in that tornado watch till at least 10 o'clock tonight. And at that time, that's a right around the high tide when the high tide is going to come in and it's a full moon high tide so above average high tide and of course a storm surge so we're going to see storm surge flooding three four maybe five feet in some spots during the nighttime hours so the next 12 hours phil are still going to be very dicey all right rob marciano in savannah for us tonight let's head now south to florida where victor kendo is in the state capital of tallahassee victor how are things looking where you are tonight well, Phil, now the race is on to restore power to tens of thousands of customers left in the dark by Hurricane Idalia. At last check, some 27,000 customers are still without power, but we know that crews are hard at work trying to get the lights back on. The biggest threats here in Tallahassee, uh, power outages, down trees, wind damage, and we saw a combination of all three. Tallahassee, in part, is known for the tree-lined streets. The city is covered in trees, and with hurricane force winds, they can bring the trees down and take power lines with them. But in the end, Tallahassee did not take the brunt of Idalia. We stopped at a shelter today and met Harold Weaver from hard hit Perry, Florida. He evacuated before the storm with his grandson, riding it out at a Tallahassee school. And after seeing the images of Perry, he tells us he's happy with his decision. What's it like for you seeing your town, Perry, on the news underwater? Man, I always thought we had we, we had close to, uh, hurricanes close to us. I said, one of these days we're going to get one. Harold tells us that he plans on returning to Perry tomorrow, but that he has no idea what kind of condition his place might be in. Really no clue what to expect here. Phil. Victor, thank you for that. Now let's bring in meteorologist Greg Dutcher from WLS in Chicago. Greg, where's the storm now? It's still tracking along the coast and tracking kind of a four-pronged threat. We have, of course, the hurricane winds, then the winds whipped up by any potential tornadoes. The northern end of this, by the way, is in effect until 4 o'clock in the morning, so we are far from out of the woods just yet. Then we've got not only the rain threat, but also the storm surge threat, too. So tracking a lot of things at this time, and one big-time spot here is Charleston that we're keeping a very close eye on. They're reporting inundation of over eight feet. And I know you're saying, wait a second, storm surge only says two to five feet. Well, you've got the storm surge. And then, as Rob Marciano mentioned earlier, the king tide on top of that. This isn't just a normal high tide. It's their highest high tide of the year. And that is peaking over the next 15 to 20 minutes. So over the next hour or so, we're going to see what that highest number is in Charleston. And they are not having a good evening. As we head towards midnight, this continues up the coast. 
flash flood warnings will still likely come out and look at these wind speeds. They're still up around 40, 45 miles per hour. Tropical storm force at some times. That's likely going to take down more tree limbs as we head into late tonight early tomorrow morning. Finally, by the mid to late morning hours, this goes back out over the Atlantic Ocean, not expected to restrengthen and thankfully too, not expected to loop back around. Some of the weather models just a couple of days ago were suggesting that maybe we get another go around. Does not look like that's going to be the case, Phil. That kind of flooding and that kind of wind always uh, troubling, but at night it's even worse. So yeah. what are you concerned about as we head into an another night now? You hit on it a little bit there. It's it's the night part of this. Rain wraps tornadoes, nocturnal tornadoes. When the sun is down, you can't see it coming at you. This is a very treed area too. So folks really have to stay on alert. They got to keep their phones next to them so they can get those EAS messages. The problem with something like this is that tornadoes will very quickly spin up in these thunderstorm cells. So it can be just a matter of moments between not having a tornado warning and then having one, Phil. All right, Greg, thanks so much. Appreciate it. it. Now let's head to South Carolina. Myrtle Beach Mayor Brenda Bethune joins us now. Mayor, it's good to see you. Thank you for taking the time. How are things where you are? Right now, things are relatively calm compared to what I thought they would be. The winds are starting to pick up. We've had some heavy bands of rain. But, you know, we're watching, waiting and watching to see what the tide does. Um, that'll be the main uh, tell her for the evening, for the night, is to see what happens with that. Yeah, I was just talking to our meteorologist about that, and night can be a really dangerous time for this kind of storm to hit. What are your biggest priorities as you head into the night? Mainly to encourage people to stay in place. Uh, this is not the time for people to be out sightseeing. We still have a lot of visitors in town and they need to stay in their hotels or wherever they are. And this is not the time for people to be driving around or walking on the beach and certainly not getting in the ocean. It's just much too dangerous and we don't know what lies ahead. Right, so I'm wondering what message you have for anyone with an upcoming trip planned to Myrtle Beach because it is such a, a great area of the country, especially in the summer. The forecast for this weekend is beautiful. We have some great events taking place this weekend. We are always really quick about cleanup efforts and this beach will look perfect by late tomorrow, early Friday. So anyone planning that trip or looking for a great weekend to visit, Myrtle Beach is the place to be. All right, Mayor Brenda Bethune, thank you so much for taking the time and best of luck as you head into this evening with your community. Thank you so much. And we are certainly going to stay on top of Idalia throughout the evening, but we are following other news right now, including a concerning episode for Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, who appeared to freeze, unable to answer a question at an event in his home state of Kentucky today. It's his second such episode this summer. Here's ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Tonight, new questions about the health of the Senate's top Republican, Mitch McConnell, after he froze in front of the cameras, seemingly unable to speak for the second time in just over a month. What are your thoughts on running for re-election in 2026? What are my thoughts about what? Running for re-election in 2026. Oh, that's good. <clears throat> Did you hear the question, Senator? Running for re-election in 2026? All right, I'm sorry, you all, we're gonna need a minute. Senator, Benny. Yep. Go ahead outside, sir. Don't come with us. The senator ultimately taking a few questions before being led away. <laughs> Last month, a similar episode on Capitol Hill. McConnell freezing for 20 seconds, unable to finish his sentence. <laughs> Are you good? Hey, Mitch. Anything else you want to say? I'm sure it's go back to your office. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say anything else to the press? McConnell's office telling ABC News in both instances, the senator just felt lightheaded. But concern is growing for the 81-year-old leader who has had a series of health scares this year. A fall in March left him with a concussion and fractured rib. He spent weeks in rehab. Then in July, another fall on an airport jet bridge. And sources tell us that for months, the senator has sometimes used a wheelchair. And Rachel joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, how are members of Congress and even the White House reacting to this latest incident today? 
Well, Phil, leaders on both sides of the aisle are wishing McConnell well tonight. President Biden says even though he disagrees with McConnell politically, he does consider him a good friend. But this is certainly putting a spotlight on the age and the health of our leaders on both sides of the aisle, including the front runners for the White House. President Biden is 80 years old. Donald Trump is 77. As for McConnell, his office tells me that he does plan to see a physician before his next event. Phil. It was hard to watch. Everybody wishing him well. Rachel, thank you. A federal judge in Georgia has found Rudy Giuliani liable for defaming two election workers during the 2020 vote aftermath. And that judge has now ordered a jury to figure out how much he owes them. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky with details. Tonight, a federal judge finding Rudy Giuliani liable for defaming Georgia election workers Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. This is what Giuliani told the world as he repeatedly and falsely accused the mother and daughter of stealing ballots. Of Ruby Freeman and Shea Freeman Moss and one other gentleman quite obviously surreptitiously passing around USB ports as if they are vials of heroin or cocaine. The women told the January 6th committee Giuliani's false claims ruined their lives. I've lost my name and I've lost my reputation. I've lost my sense of security, all because a group of people starting with number 45 and his ally, Rudy Giuliani, decided to scapegoat me and my daughter, Shay, to push their own lies about how the presidential election was stolen. Giuliani has conceded his statements about Moss and Freeman were false, though he insists they were protected by the First Amendment. But today, Judge Beryl Howell holding him liable for defamation, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and civil conspiracy. She says she entered the default judgment because Giuliani failed to turn over evidence, only, quote, blobs of indecipherable data. Now a jury will decide how much Giuliani has to pay Freeman and Moss. He's said to be nearly broke, though he arrived in Georgia to surrender on criminal charges in a private plane. No word tonight on who foot the bill. A spokesman for Giuliani called today's ruling a prime example of the weaponization of the justice system. Freeman and Moss said it affirmed there was never any truth to any of the accusations. They said they went through a living nightmare and that Giuliani unleashed a wave of hatred and threats they never could have imagined. Phil. All right, Aaron Katursky tonight. Thank you, Aaron. Baseball legend David Ortiz revealing today he is a victim of an extortion attempt by hackers. Ortiz, known to fans as Big Poppy, claims hackers gained access to one of his old cell phones and are threatening to reveal personal information. The former Boston Red Sox slugger came forward in a video posted to his social media, adding that authorities in both the United States and Dominican Republic are taking action in the case. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, Ukraine launches its most far-reaching drone attack on Russia since the start of the war. Uh, the vow Ukraine is now making about its future tactics. But up next, in an apparent coup in Africa, the election decision that may have convinced military officers to take action against the government. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Santa Fe, New Mexico, I'm Lindsay Davis. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. The Mexican government deployed armed forces across the border city of Ciudad Juarez to fight organized crime. Soldiers marched in the streets in a mission to prevent murders and migrant trafficking. Murder rates fell last year, but the government is still on track to register a record total of murders for any six-year administration. Chile's president has launched a national search plan for the thousands who disappeared in the years of military dictatorship. During those bloody 17 years, more than 1,400 people were victims of forced disappearance. The searches for them have normally, at best, led to families being given bone fragments identified as their family members who disappeared. Many around the region remain to be found and or identified. Hundreds of people in Gabon took to the streets cheering soldiers and police officers after military officers declared they had seized power in the country. Earlier today, military officers appeared on national television and proclaimed they had taken power less than an hour after the election commission said President Ali Bongo had won a third term. Citing a lack of electoral credibility, the officers announced they had annulled the election results, closed Gabon's borders until further notice and dissolved the state institutions. Next tonight, Ukraine launching its most far-reaching drone attack yet deep inside Russia across at least six regions. ABC's Britt Clennett in Kyiv for us. Tonight, Ukraine unleashing its most widespread drone attacks inside Russia since the war began, seen in footage posted online. This airbase in Peskov, one of several military targets across at least six regions. Video circulating on social media showing thick smoke rising above the facility. At least four military planes destroyed. A fuel depot and military supply factory also struck. Russia today retaliating in the biggest attack on Kyiv since spring with a barrage of drones and missiles. The debris killing at least two people. Crews hosing down the smoldering wreckage in this neighborhood. And residents picking up the pieces after missile fragments and fiery debris rained down on their homes. Tonight, Moscow vowing drone attacks on Russian soil will not go unpunished. But Ukraine now signaling it is willing to hit Russia where it's most vulnerable, a tactic Ukraine's spy chief warned about months ago. Do you think there'll be more? I think so. Yeah, more attacks? inside Russia, deep inside Russia. Deeper and deeper. And Brit joins me now from Kyiv. Brit, there is word now of potential deals between Russia and North Korea. What's the latest you have? Yeah, Phil, it looks like a potential deal is in the works which would involve arms to use in its war here in Ukraine. Meanwhile, on those drone attacks in Russia, a Kremlin propagandist on state TV had some very rare criticism, saying if we can't cope with drones, how will we cope with F-16s? Phil? Valid question. Britt Clennett from Kyiv tonight. Britt, thank you. And still to come, the road to the ring for Good Morning America's Robin Roberts and her fiance, how family and friends are helping to pave the way for the couple's big day. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And finally tonight, love is in the air. Our friend and Good Morning American anchor Robin Roberts and her fiancé Amber will be getting married soon. But before they say their I do's, her friends and family wanted to send their best wishes. Here's our Gio Benitez with a look into Robin and Amber's road to the ring. You may kiss the ride. <laughs> You've heard it right here several times. I definitely do. I do. Over the years, we've helped so many of you celebrate your love. <laughs> even including our GMA family. I do. By the power invested in me from GMA. <laughs> <laughs> this time, our own Robin Roberts is taking the walk down the aisle. I'm excited for the wedding day. Our friends seeing us for the first time as a married couple. I'm looking forward to the joy, the pure joy of that day. Really looking forward to bringing everybody together. Her family is amazing, bringing everyone together and celebrating life. Robin and Amber's tribe joining in on the fun. Mama, baby. Many who've been a part of their journey from the beginning. It's just wonderful to be able to celebrate their love, their romance, their storybook, fairy tale love. I'm so glad that this day is coming. Like Robin's dear sister, Sally Ann. Robin has always been an exceptional human being, and Amber is just so perfect for her. They just, they can complete each other's sentences. And longtime GMA co-anchor, Diane Sawyer. It's as if two stars merged, and the light is so bright, you can't describe it to people. They are the w most wonderful combination of ease and joy. Plus good friend, Niecy Nash. When I first found out that Robin and Amber were gonna get married, I was shocked because I said, I thought they were already married. They are each other's better half, for sure. Baby, you're a it's been fireworks since the day Robin and Amber met in 2005. Congratulations, Amber and Robin. Chefing up the biggest advice for the couple with Carla Hall. Laughter is the key to a marriage success channel. Mm-hmm. So when you're mad, find some humor in there and just share it. <laughs> just like that. Their loved ones sending their best wishes as they get ready to say, I do. Just really do your best to sort of cherish the good moments. You'll be hitting your 28th uh, before you know. You guys are the ultimate yeah. ride or die. You're an inspiration to all of us, and I couldn't be happier for the two of you. It gives me hope because I know true love really exists, and you guys embody that. Cheering you on always, always. It has just been a gift to be able to be in your lives and to be at this moment with you. My prayer for you is that you will have many, many, many happy and healthy years together, that you will enjoy peace, prosperity, purpose, and freedom. I love you both. Beautiful and so well said. We are happy for them both. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. This is ABC News Live. The crush of